But it seems like he's making this as universal as possible. It's the sort of need, the perpetual clamoring for the reinstitution of the big other. Here are all the options that seem to be on the table, and here's why they all go wrong. Our dances like trails and blazes with the metal getting wrong, sticking labels on this song. Fake ladies and medals get their shit on, made up and murdered with women gliding with their wings gone. Hey, what up everybody? Welcome to the Lake Show. Welcome to the Lake Show. The LeBron Show. No, I'm just kidding. Welcome to Owls at Dawn. We are just two dudes from Southern California, obviously, who study philosophy, <laughs> politics, and religion around the world and decided to start a podcast where we could bullshit with impunity and maybe talk about some basketball at some point, I'm sure, because LeBron is going to the Lakers. How are you, my friend? I'm doing pretty well, all things considered. You're lucky I have the shitty minute this week because otherwise we would be going on the long rant. Oh, uh, don't you worry. I might be nice and give you a, a volley. No, no, no. Do we gotta follow the rules? This is not nom. There are rules. <laughs> there are rules. Uh, anyway, for people listening, I'm Austin Hayden Smith, and I am Troy Polidori. And this week we're gonna pick up our proprietary parliamentary book club, going through Sergei Prozorov's Void Universalism. Well, World Politics: Void Universalism One, uh, Chapter Two this week. If you are not caught up, if you have not heard the previous two episodes, you could actually dive right in. It shouldn't be too much of a problem, but I definitely would recommend checking the previous two episodes. From two weeks ago, we talked about chapter one, and then two weeks prior to that, we talked about sort of an introduction. We talked about the introduction and sort of the argument that he's laying out in the text. But of course, before we get into the meat of the program it's the shitty minute where one of us rants and raves about whatever it is that is pissing us off this week and it's troy's turn so what's up brother uh i had a hard time thinking of a shitty minute this week that was sort of conceptual or in the political discourse because all, all the bullshit that's been going on recently is just you know par for the course of the last couple of years so from personal experience the only thing i could really come up with is that i had to move this last weekend and moving okay. sucks. Like, I'm not sure <laughs> anything it? sucks as much as moving. Very few things suck as much as it does. Like, even other things that suck, like, really, really bad are maybe physical discomfort that you get from aging. Or if you have to have surgery or you have, you know, some chronic condition that just never goes away. That's, that's one of the things that just makes life terrible, right? I feel like even with that, though... There's a sense in which you just kind of like, get used to it over time. You know how like they say um, that people who lose limbs so they become quadriplegic, that the first three months or so, they have a drastic uh, decrease in the quality of life. But then after the that three to five months period, they actually tend to normalize and have the same quality of life as anybody else, um, all else being mm-hmm. equal. But moving is like... Moving, moving is just the worst because you know it's coming and you can prepare for it all you want, but nothing's really going to deal with the various problems that arise and the difficulties that arise and, you know, people not really being able to help you as much as they say or whatever. And it's like, it just sucks. It's kind of weird that we haven't come up with like a Hold better on. way Hold on. Do you want to out people? This. Is that what you want to do right now? Is this a? Are you trying to out? Who? Go ahead. Who, who fucked you over? Charlie? No, I, I was on. actually We're I was ready. actually talking hypothetically, so there's nobody to out. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, and a part of it's my own fault because I didn't really realize how much shit that I have. I don't think of myself as a hoarder, but I've had to I've had to like I've had to think about that a little bit more. Sort of um like re diagnose myself. Maybe I've hoarded a bit when it comes to books and uh Yeah. Various other goods. When the real smacks you in the face, it's a shock, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so was it what was it mostly? Was it books? Was it clothes? Was it like electronic stuff, kitchen stuff. It's just everything, man. I mean, when you when you're when you're a single yeah. dude and you live in your own place, you just have to accumulate all the different things, right? And so you're just taking it all with you. And it's a lot. It's a lot of shit. Yeah. Yeah, we had a friend or we have a friend who just recently moved from San Diego to Los Angeles, and she asked publicly on Twitter if people who had moved frequently had any advice for her. And I was like, I mean, I've moved a lot. I mean, a lot in my life, right? But most of it, especially in the last 10 years, has been international moves. And barring one situation, I literally just had 
the equivalent of a suitcase, maybe a suitcase and a half, and a carry-on bag's worth of things in general. So I was like, I am not the person to ask about this because <laughs> what I do when it's time to move is I just give shit away. <laughs> That's the thing, man. <laughs> you if, you move, if you move uh, across the country or internationally, you pretty much just have to shed all your stuff. It's just not really a choice. I, mo- I moved right. across town. So you don't really have an excuse to not just take all your stuff with you. And so I did, and that made it so much worse. It's just the worst kind of move. It seems like it'd be the easiest kind of move because it's so close. You just drive, you know, the U-Haul back and forth. Yeah. But then, yeah, it's 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 a whole bunch of shit. It's just not. It's just terrible. How have we not solved this? How many problem trips yet? total? Yeah, what, I know. What, well, what's like because Elon Musk is trying to get us to to move to Mars. That's more well, important, dude. What's like the what's like the cartoon where they would take all your goods and like shrink ray them down into the one little cube? And then you can move it over and then and then sort of bring it back out again. That feels very Jetson-y, but I don't know. Yeah, that, that should have happened by now. Yeah, I'm down. How many how many trips total did it take you guys? Uh, I was one for each Between of us. Between the two of you. Yeah, one for each of us. Okay, so that's not too bad then. That's not too bad. Yeah, when you're pretty much the only guy <laughs> lifting stuff, it's it's pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. And it was, well, down, it was downstairs like... both times and upstairs. At the new place, yeah. So it was it was the worst. This is really this is really like in, in like entrancing podcast experience. You ever listen to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> wow, I tuned in to listen to philosophy, politics, and religion. Talk about and moving their cultural dumb criticism. Shit. <laughs> and these fuckers are complaining about <laughs> moving across town in the suburbs. Here, 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 here. <laughs> You you can definitely add us anybody who's who's still listening at this point. Add us with your most boring, <laughs> mundane, terrible moving experiences, and we'll read them, all of them, maybe like twice to make up for this. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm actually curious how because they they say that moving is one of the most stressful uh, things that people endure in their lives. Oh, yeah. Like, um, I I think actually on the list of causes for divorce it actually ranks quite highly as one of the sort of proximate causes yeah i mean it's obviously not the ultimate cause but it's a proximate cause right or it's a catalyst or it just adds certain measures of stress but they say that moving is one of those things i mean i I, it it has not obtained for me for me that it just has not been the case i Always have had fun helping friends move. I've always owned pickup trucks. So you're obviously inevitably the dude that they call. They're like, bro, can you help me move? And you're like, fuck yeah. But then it's always turned into like like bros, like lifting refrigerators and like, and then laughing and drinking beers. So in that circumstance, it sounds fun to me. And so that's been my experience of like the shitty, quote unquote, shitty moving. It hasn't been that shitty. It's been okay. You know? And then internationally, like I said, it's just not a problem because I just pack up a suitcase and get on a plane. Yeah, if you have ideal circumstances, I can see why it would be just a minor nuisance. But if you don't have ideal circumstances, it fucking sucks. You know what the worst part even is? I think even worse than the move is that week or two after the move when your shit's everywhere and you're not really sure where to put it because it's not like ideal. You have storage space, but not ideal storage space, right? And so you're just kind of yeah. leaving things. You got work to do, right? Your life is still going on. So you just have like right. all this stuff lying around. And if you're if you're neurotic like I am, it's just causing you massive anxiety at every moment that you're right. like, awake. Dude, I can't help but laugh because literally everything that is causing you panic, I am like, oh my god, that's my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh man, that's so much fun because you get to figure out how you're going to decorate shit and where you're going to put stuff and you get to like be creative with it and things are kind of, you get to, you know, basically you get to sleep on a mattress for a little bit and it's sort of like being a kid and camping. You get to build a fort. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, the OCD part of me likes to sort of organize stuff and put it where it's supposed to be. But then if you don't have the ideal space for it, then you just kind of let yeah. it sitting around. And that, that causes yeah. the anxiety. I can see that. I can see that. Yeah, that's when you just got to cut off the limb, brother, and just hold a little a little garage sale. Dude, so much, I've, I've thrown away and given on, like, free cycle or whatever, <laughs> Facebook free cycle thing, so much shit. Yeah, I bet. I just wanted nothing to do with whatever $40 I could have gotten from it. All right, right. I'm glad you're settled. I'm glad you got a new place. And this will be a fun new chapter of your life. Yeah, thanks for the wisdom, Chief. And hopefully she'll convert you to being a musical theater lover in no time. Well, let's not start uh, doxing people on this podcast. <laughs> All right, so for our main segment, we're talking about Chapter 2 
of Sergei Prozorov's Ontology and World Politics, Void Universalism. Should we give a quick recap of what we talked about uh, two weeks ago with uh, Chapter 1 before we start? Yes. Yes. So Chapter 1 was... Um, Prozorov was talking about his three concepts of the world, capital W, world. And those three concepts were the world does everything, the world does something, and the world does nothing. And so I guess the, the basic idea was before we can talk about world politics, we have to talk about what the world is, what is the subject of world politics. And uh, Prozorov wanted to introduce these first, the first two conceptions, uh, world does everything and world does something, in order to reject them. And so the, the basic argument was we shouldn't conceive of the world as everything because um, the idea of there being a totality is an incoherent, inconsistent concept. The world as something is usually the next sort of particularistic conception to follow that. And that he thinks should be rejected because it doesn't actually, uh, he thinks it just kind of like doesn't really quite achieve the goals, right? We just have particularistic conceptions of the world competing against one another you don't really have a world politics so it falls short of the goal and world does nothing is the one he wants to actually introduce as a position which avoids the problems associated with the world is everything and then also tries to actually fulfill the goals that the world as something doesn't quite achieve that sound pretty good yeah i think that's pretty perfect so, yeah, it's a, it's a reconception of the world, which means that chapter two now is examining politics, and it's his reconception of what politics is. And so he basically starts it off by saying this. So if the world is nothing, well, maybe we should probably just really briefly just say what we mean by, by nothing. Uh, he doesn't mean that it does not exist in the sense that it's not there Although here we're kind of running into slippery language because in a sense it does not exist because according to Heidegger, to exist means to stand forth. And the world is that which remains when all that stands forth, when all of the identities of a positive world sort of dissolve and are scraped away. And it's that radical, unbounded realm of multiplicity that he says is the void. And how we describe the void, go back to the previous episode and, and we'll kind of, um, we discuss that a little bit and so it'll make it a little bit clearer. So then he says, okay, so if that's the case, if we've got this concept of the world as nothing, how the fuck can you build a politics that is built on this idea of nothingness, right? Or the nothing or the void. So basically he says that he wants to take up the challenge of rethinking world politics. This is a quote Take up the challenge of rethinking world politics on the basis of the concept of the world as void and venture to derive universal principles of such politics from the disclosure of the world, in particular, worlds. The redefinition of politics as such is then made on the basis of the world as void. So what he means by that is that there's a difference between, let's say, what we would use as the everyday sort of description of the world, um, which is this radical proliferation of these contexts or of these regions or nation states or identity spheres, any set, right, is a small w world in his text. But the capital W world is the world as void, and that's this universal grounding, this ontological grounding uh, upon which he wants to derive these universal principles for politics that stands in relation to the particular worlds that have a sort of like infinite proliferation. So what, right? what an example of that, I'm trying to think of some actual positive examples that we can use to illustrate this point. Um, think about like the American nation state, for instance. Um, that's a kind of world, right? a political world. Right. Would the idea that uh, you and I are both economically consumers, politically democratic subjects be identities, which he's talking about here as being part of this world that's governed by a transcendental order. Yeah, exactly. They would be identities within that particular world. And he'll make the argument in this chapter that the idea of statehood itself is, in a sense, the 
the totality of managing or combining those transcendental identities or those transcendental indexes, right? The identities that exist within the nation state of the United States, the, it, uh, or let's say that the totality that is or the world that is uh, the nation state of the United States is composed of or is, is the totality of um, all of these various identities that, that make it up. So in a part whole kind of relation. Yeah. But within that world, there are other worlds. And that's not a capital W world. That's a particular world, a small w world. And within the uh, United States nation state world, there are other worlds. There's the world of California, the world of Ohio. And then within the world of California, there's the world of the individual cities. Let's say the city of Valencia, the city of Los Angeles. I'm in the city of Sydney, Australia. That's a world. And then even within them, um, there are these worlds within these worlds within these worlds to, to, to the the sort of most minuscule thing that we can conceive of. I'm in a bedroom right now, and in my bedroom, this is a world that is made up of these various identities that exist within this world. And all of these worlds relate to one another. Um, they inhere within one another. They inflict upon one another. Um, maybe they conflict with one another in certain ways. And so there is this model that he's developing of worlds within worlds within worlds that... Uh, contrasts with capital W world as void. Yeah, I like this idea because it's kind of like um, like a, a myriological universalism, which is the idea that any two objects, any two or more objects form a whole that is greater than the sum of their parts. Mm. And I find that idea fairly intuitive because right. you combine two things together, uh, my left sock with... Uh, an Australian flag that is in Melbourne somewhere. Hmm. And as much as those two created a world. Yeah. And uh, it's a mundane world and it probably has no actual interesting facts other than to be used as an example of this principle. Right. But there is a sense, very mundane sense that those two things have a sort of relation as simplistic as it might be. Um, And so that, that seems pretty intuitive to me. And uh, obviously it gets more interesting when you talk about, things that actually do have um, effects on one another. But you kind of have to start with that very mundane level to make the point clear. Right, right. And the reason that it matters for Prozorov is because politics, as we generally conceive of it, takes place oftentimes within the relations within these particular worlds, right? So we think of, you know, what's going on in the United States right now. Uh, The trade war, for example, that uh, is, is burgeoning right now between the United States and China and the EU and elsewhere, Canada. And um, that is a conflict of these particular worlds that is taking place. So the question is, is, is that politics? Is that a political thing? And Prozorov will actually come to argue that, that in itself, that isn't what politics is. He wants to reconceive politics. That's something else. That's an intra-worldly phenomena uh, that's taking place. Those are intra-worldly relational activities, but that's not politics for him. But would it be intra-worldly or inter-worldly when you have two different worlds? Intra-worldly. Okay, well, I mean, isn't intra-worldly within one world? Well, I mean, I guess, but it would be both, right? Because this is where he, he wants to reject the idea of international relations before okay. because that's yeah. just the relations of external worlds that are relating. So it would be both. Um so in, in the world, let's say in the globe, on planet Earth, that's the world in which these intra-worldly tensions or relations are taking place. And the way that they take place is under the guise of inter-worldly or international relations. But he wants to kind of move beyond that and think of how can we think of world politics that eschews the inter-worldly external tension or relationality and that also then tries to situate then what is going on on the global scale as being an intra-worldly relation or set of relations. Yeah, I get that. I'm thinking about something he says later in regards to okay. Rancière, which we'll get to, but yeah. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Um, so then, yeah. Uh, so then, I guess, where do we go here? Uh, so the state then, uh, this is a quote, the state is merely an historically specific form that this order might take, and there is nothing necessary about its existence. And this is, I thought, where you would get all excited because he starts quoting Mayasu at one point <laughs> and talking about how states are not necessary, 
social relations are not necessary. These identities within these this this intra-worldly field of relations, they're not necessary. They are all contingent and could be otherwise. Yeah, and so the claim here is it's much stronger than it might appear on the surface. So you're reading a book about you know, international relations and world politics. You might say, well, the fact that a political order is contingent, that's that's pretty well accepted, right? I mean, when's the last time a, a major historical movement argued that there was a political order which is not contingent? Marxism, like vulgar Marxism, the monarchical order, right? <laughs> In Europe. Hmm. So, I mean, most people, I think, reject those notions, right? And want to argue that politi- political orders are contingent. But Prozorov's saying that the only reason political orders are contingent is because, in a sense, ontological orders are contingent, right? Say that again? I think the claim that Prozorov is making, maybe I'm making it too strongly, but is that the reason political orders are contingent, which I think most people agree with that, but his argument is that they're only contingent because ontological orders are contingent. So the very identities we have that are situated by politics, um, those things are contingent. He's not saying in sense, maybe my claim is it's separating politics and ontology too much because he's sort of overlapping them, right? Um, right? So it's not just the orders themselves that are contingent, but it's all the sort of members of those orders that are contingent, right? Right, yeah. Okay, the only thing is, this, so you said ontological, and I think that we should make a distinction between ontological and ontic. So I would say that the ontic, which is the phenomenological, those are contingent, whereas the ontological, I don't think is contingent. Yeah, when you make the Heideggerian distinction, ontological difference there, then yeah. Ontic okay. Okay, versus yeah. ontological. I, I got, okay. I'm referring more in just terms of the the orders of of being, small b. But yeah, to be more precise, it's the ontic orders that are contingent. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I, I actually like wrote down like a shitload of quotes. So I think there's a quote here that kind of fits into this. He says... So, in other words, what he wants to do is to develop a concept of politics without any recourse to the state, the international, or any other particular transcendental order, which are all themselves to be rethought as derivative from and epiphenomenal to politics. And that's politics as universal and ontological. That kind of cuts through and undergirds and grounds, if you will, all of these epiphenomenal uh, orders. And that includes not just the state, like you just said, but also everything within the state. The laws, we just had Heidi Matthews on last week. Uh, I think she would be on board with this 100%, that the law, as she said, is a sort of, what did she call it, a, a contingent technology of power that, that itself is derivative of uh, or derivative from an epiphenomenal to the grounding that is politics for Prozorov. Yes, that's a really strong claim, right? Because even those who would sort of distance themselves from, say, Marxism as being a totalizing discourse, which um, kind of perpetuates itself as being non-contingent, as being sort of a necessary flow to history, um, one might reject that and say, yeah, but we're also, we should reject that because we're sort of fundamentally individual, rational consumers, and therefore Marxism doesn't Mm -hmm. work or whatever, right? And that's, that would fall under this critique as well, just as much as mm. sort of, you know, big M Marxism would. Yeah, that's what's interesting is that, uh, is that he's not pulling any punches here. I mean, I think he, he kind of considers himself some sort of anarcho-communist because when you read this, the, the anarchism really comes through, <laughs> right? But at the same time, he's a sort of communalist as well. And as, as we'll see when he starts developing what these axioms are, one of the axioms is precisely this idea of community or fraternity. So, but at the same time, he's also really skeptical of state power. He's really skeptical of grand narratives, we might say. So the, the grand narrative of dialectical materialism that wants to see the dialectic as being uh, a motor, if you will, that, that cuts through all of history that sort of grounds, if you will, the social conflicts that you have seen historically for millennia, you know, the history of all history, uh, hitherto is the history of class struggle, right? That sort of thing. I think he would call that into question as being what he calls an imperfect nihilism. Yeah, that's a good segue, right? Because uh, Prozorov says the, the sort of 
worry you would have given this claim that all these orders are contingent is that this falls directly into nihilism, right? If mm. everything is contingent, then that means there's nothing necessary that you can ground any of those contingencies on. They seem to just be free floating. And then you might have all that's left is the sort of um, back and forth of power, which seems kind of mm. ugly, right? And you might call that nihilism. Mm. And so he distinguishes the three types of nihilism that Nietzsche mentions. Imperfect nihilism, as you just mentioned, which he says is the when you fill this empty void that's only full of you know particularistic contingencies with a false universal. So an example mm -hmm. of this would be like what? Well, I mean, he he talks about identity politics and says that identity politics. So let's give let's give a left example and then let's give a more classic liberal or conservative example. Identity politics is the perpetual need to fill in the gaps of the void with some sort of positive ascription and then imbue that positive ascription with some sort of uh, universal ontological status or uh, to inflate that particular status with some sort of universal ontological significance, which is just a sort of, in a way, is it, is it a sort of like ad hoc resistance to the world as void that cuts through, could we say that? Yeah, I like the idea that it's ad hoc because it's sort of just grabbing yeah. at whatever you, sort of the tools you have that are there to, uh, to avoid this nihilistic trap that you think you see. Right, okay, and then the conservative or classical liberal example would be Jordan Peterson and what he's doing and his response and his resistance and his fear to what he considers as the sort of like nothingness or free-floating signification of postmodernism, he then wants to go back to these classical liberal identities or these classical liberal values to cover over, if you will, the radical flux, let's say, or the radical unboundedness or the radical ubiquity of the nothing as void. Uh, that too is imperfect nihilism. Yeah, and the interesting thing about sort of the Jordan Petersons and some of these... Um you know, new conservative figures is that whereas you traditionally think about, you know, conservative, you know, fundamentalist movements as being sort of quote unquote true believers, right? Those who still do believe that there is a universal that you can sort of hold on to and that applies to everyone all the time. The new, the new conservative figures seem to actually almost implicitly reject that. Like they know that there isn't really a universal, but then you have to kind of pretend that there is. Otherwise, like, we're all going to be fucked. Yeah, it's it's that... It, well, I mean, because Peterson obviously wants to say that the universals exist in, like, myth-making, and so he appeals to Jung and the idea of these universal archetypes um, that, you know, are, like, biologically created, which was one of the things that Jung articulated, right? And so Peterson, when when he gets pushed to his limits, that's what he ultimately just kind of projects it's Jungian archetypes and uh, evolutionary psychology right that's really what his bedrock is that's the kind of foundation upon which he builds his entire epistemic system so it is kind of it is kind of interesting but at the same time I kind of always wonder if this isn't just the same sort of argument that you get with like the C.S. Lewis moral argument for the existence of God where it's like well if we don't have this stuff then what's to stop us from just raping and killing and torturing babies for fun and it's it's a very sort of well because we because this is difficult and because this is a very complex matter i'm just going to rest in a very simple sort of covering over of the problem with an answer that i can reasonably assert and cling to so i can sleep well at night and i get it i do get it it gives you a comfort. That's why Nietzsche, when he says that God is dead and when he talks about the mooring being detached and stuff like that, that it's frightening and terrifying. Freedom is fucking terrifying. But that doesn't mean that you reactionarily or that you react and you have to then suppress that by covering over it. Yeah, it's interesting too, right? Because it's, it's obviously sort of avoiding one problem, right? The idea of the grounding of sort of justice and morality and the good. By also ignoring like the Euthyphro problem, right? Like, how can that even be a ground? Like, just claiming mm. that God exists as the sort of moral lawgiver, therefore, 
there are certain things that are intrinsically good. It's like, well, there's a missing premise there. Like, is God just defining goodness just because he's pleased by it or likes it, it therefore becomes good, like a divine command theory type of position? Because at that point, I mean, I guess all you're arguing for is like a pragmatic conception. Like, people have right. to believe that there's a, a hell after death in order, in order to kind of keep them in line on, in line on earth. And I think we've already found that that doesn't actually work all that well in practice. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's the sort of need the 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 perpetual clamoring for the reinstitution of the big other that that Lacanian psychoanalysis talks about, right? And that that I think is kind of a description of what's happening with the imperfect nihilism. It's it's not being able to reconcile with the fact that there is no big other. <laughs> yeah, and so after imperfect nihilism comes passive nihilism. And this is the notion for Nietzsche of um, those who would give up on the idea of universalism in total in favor of the perpetual, I guess, play of antagonistic particularisms. Okay. So I think what Prozorov has in mind here in, in our own context would be sort of most of the postmodern figures, right? Like your Foucaults and your mm. Derrida's, et cetera. Mm. And that fits, that kind of maps on analogously to his criticism of the world as something. Exactly right. Yeah. Which he, in the introduction, referred to as nihilism, the radical sort of prolifer proliferation of particularities. So there's, he's being repetitive in a way, because in the introduction, he makes the argument that he calls nihilism about these like regional particularities that are competing with one another, cultural relativism. And then in the second chapter, he kind of talks about that as in ontological terms as being the world as something. And then here he's talking about it politically as being a passive nihilism. So it, it, it's almost like he's repackaging it from the sort of broad conceptual international relations to the ontological and now to the political, but it's the same kind of homological resonance that cuts through all of them. Yeah, it's just the structure here. He's finding the same structure in all these different um, yeah. conceptions. And it's really nice. I mean, it's actually, I find the argument really compelling because of that. Because it's, it's repetitive, but it's not, no, no, it's not repetitive. It's, it's the repetition of difference is what it is. It's a sort of, here are the conceptual categories that I'm going to explore, but I'm going to perpetually flesh them out. It's like a, 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 like a circulating or pulsating matrix that's shifting around a node. And I kind of like that approach. Yeah, I was thinking of like a spiral staircase, right? It's got that same yeah. structure, but it keeps going up. Mm, mm, I like that. Yeah. Okay, so then what's after passive nihilism? And so the final one then is active nihilism. And this is sort of, this was Nietzsche's sort of preferred option, right? It's where you, um, you neither give up on the idea of universalism, nor do you try and um, posit or fill the void with a false universal. But you realize both of those are wanting, and you instead posit your own values, create your own values, like the Ubermensch does for Nietzsche. Uh, Transvaluation, going beyond the values you're given and creating one's own. Um, and yeah. while that's Nietzsche's preferred option, Prozorov actually thinks this is just as sort of fatal as the first two. Yeah, and he comes, and he'll develop it later, he comes to align this with the political theology of Carl Schmitt, right? And then he says, actually, the problem with Carl Schmidt is most people, they read Carl Schmidt as saying like, oh, he's kind of like being overly political in certain ways. And he says, but actually the problem with Schmidt is he's not political enough, which is interesting. Yeah, I think we should talk about that now since it fits this. Um, okay, cool. Acting, that was my idea. So I really, really liked his conception of Schmidt because I've always, Schmidt's sort of friend-enemy distinction, you hear about it in all sorts of spheres, right? It's one of those weird things that conservatives and liberals um, in the in the philosophical political sense tend to both cite as being very important and having some influence from and that's pretty <laughs> rare right you don't see a lot of conservatives being like oh yeah Foucault I love the idea of you know knowledge power or whatever um, right whereas Schmidt um, obviously himself was a, a sort of he was a jurist right in Germany during like the post-nazi regime or like during and right after I think is that mm -hmm. the case? Yeah, I think before, before, during, and after. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, obviously very complicit in a number of things. 
And Schmidt's sort of big deal was promoting this notion of the friend-enemy distinction. And so Schmidt, like what Prozorov is denoting, wants us to see that politics really isn't founded on any sort of universal that we can ascribe to, whether it be sort of monarchical power, divine right, or some religious notion that uh, enables one to have political power given from God, uh, like a theocracy, or even um, Marxism or liberal democratic order. Any of those all sort of fall apart. And that really politics is founded on decision. So I think isn't isn't Schmidt sometimes referred to as holding like a decisionist or decisionism as a position? Yeah, so uh, it's this idea. So I'll, I'll read a quote here. So Schmidt's theory of sovereignty is the perfect expression of active nihilism. The sovereign decision, which positively constitutes the intra-worldly transcendental order, famously, and this is a quote from Schmidt, emanates from nothingness. So insofar as there is an irreducible plurality of worlds constituted in this unfounded manner, so there's nothingness, it emanates from nothingness because there is this irreducible plurality of worlds, so insofar as it's constituted in this unfounded manner, politics is doomed to remain a potentially antagonistic conflict between particularisms. So there has to be some sort of overcoming of the kind of passive nihilistic orientation of the world. Right. So for, for Schmidt, you don't appeal to anything ontological to sort of tell you where to go in terms of developing a political order. You basically just make, the sovereign just makes a decision and says, here's the friend, here's the enemy, here's us, and here's them. So you can think right. of an example as being like native born versus immigrant, right? Who are the people who are given rights in a society, the rights given by one's constitution or um, political order? And you can see that as being emanating from nothingness. It's just a decision. We just say people right. who are born on this soil that's delineated by a bunch of lines get these rights, and those who do not or have not been um, born within these lines don't get them. And you could probably see that as being understandable as within this sort of friend-enemy distinction, right? It's just this is them and this is us. Absolutely. Uh, there's something interesting. So, so then the point would be is – for Prozorov, that that's not actually a political orientation. It is an intra-phenomenological form of management, or what Ranciere might call uh, a form of policing, and we'll probably get to that in a little bit. But at, then what you get is you get this state as sovereign that comes or emerges out of or emanates out of the nothingness, there is no ground, makes a somewhat arbitrary decision and establishes the identities or what Ranciere calls the distribution of the sensible relations within a given order. And it establishes it and it sets up this distinction and that distinction then and, and that decision is essentially not political. So Prozorov then wants to argue against that form as well as the other two forms, obviously against imperfect nihilism, against passive nihilism, and then against active nihilism by arguing instead that despite the impossibility, another quote, despite the impossibility of drawing any positive prescription directly from the void of the world, its disclosure within worlds provides us with political principles that are valid for any world whatsoever. So the world as void makes politics irreducible to the reproduction of the positive order of the world, which is precisely devoid of any such essence or foundation. So active nihilism, the Schmidtian form of creating this friend-enemy distinction, is essentially not political because it is devoid of any essence or foundation, and it ignores the world as void because it simply reproduces a particular positive order of a particular world that was based on an arbitrary sovereign decision. Yeah, I think this is really important because it's also kind of my huge problem with both Nietzsche and Heidegger. And there's this notion for Nietzsche, right, of um, transvaluating, going beyond the values you have and creating your own. And Heidegger, there's this description of Das Mann, right, the they who sort of interpolates everybody with all the sort of figures within it and tells them how they're supposed to live and what they're supposed to do and 
you need to remove yourself from that, right? And actually suffer angst or anxiety to truly be human in a sense, right? And they're kind of similar structurally in that way um, with Schmidt as well. And for my my sort of criticism of that idea was just that it's just it's just not possible. Like anytime you remove yourself from sort of societal, the quote unquote societal values or whatever um, conceptual order you've sort of been born into in your environment, you ended up just like focusing only on whatever leftover animalistic desires you have and those just drive you. So it's not really emanating from nothingness. Schmidt claims that this decision emanates from nothingness, but it doesn't actually emanate from nothingness. It emanates from yourself and whatever leftover conceptions you have of yourself that you think you've gotten rid of, but you probably haven't. And so it seems mm. to me it's just as likely this is going to come out in some horrible, xenophobic, racist, sexist, hateful direction, which of course it has in many, in many sort of circumstances. When you think that you're free, but you're actually still have like one arm connected to the, the handcuff when you think you've actually like unlocked both of them. Or something, and I'm, I'm like using a lot of metaphors here. But. No, I, I like I like the metaphor. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. You're still I like that idea of you think you think you're free, but you're still locked in. And the reason you're still locked in is because you're just perpetuating and reproducing the the unnoticed or unacknowledged ideological positive phenomena of your intraworldly experience. And so I'm thinking here of like. Feuerbach, Marx, and their criticism of ideology or criticisms of religion in a way as sort of being an inversion of reality, right? It's – we don't think that we're still conditioned – no, I guess it would be less Feuerbach and more Marx actually uh, in his critique of ideology is, is you think that you're free but really you're just reproducing these ideological conditions that you never actually separated yourself from and they then have become the unconscious bedrock, the the – the unacknowledged, unconscious bedrock of your new identity, but they themselves need to be subject to criticism. Yeah, I think you see that exact same structure like in modern sort of libertarianism, right? It holds itself 100%. up as sort of removed from ideology purely, right? Getting rid of all the religions and all the um, political ideologies, um, the more conservative, like, you know, sort of religious political order on one side and like murdered the more like Marxist leftist on the other side and being a totally pure um, non-ideological force when it's so obvious that it clearly is founded on ideas of property and individuality that are extremely ideological. I mean this goes to the problem of, of negative freedom itself as being the benchmark that ultimately detaches us from all domination. That negative freedom still has elements of positive freedom or compulsion embedded within it. Yeah, so I, mean, I really like um, Prozorov's point here that it's something I hadn't really thought about. I'd always thought about sort of the active nihilism Nietzsche promotes as its, its strength is that it's in its arbitrarity, right? It's, you're supposed to just make a decision kind of based on nothing, but that never really actually happens, right? And to claim that your decision is arbitrary or that a sovereign decision is arbitrary is probably just covering over its non-arbitrariness, right? Trying to either consciously or unconsciously hide the fact that there actually is a basis for that decision. And it's probably in many cases going to be a hateful and destructive one. And that's why you have to hide it behind this sort of guise of decisionism. And in contrast to that, um, Prozor is saying, what if we actually did have something that did emanate from nothingness, that actually was derived or entailed by the world as void as he's discussing it? Now, whatever that might look like in practice, we're going to get to in the next episode, I think. But I yeah. like that idea of sort of, here's the false version of that, right? This active nihilism, the Schmidian concepts. This is why it doesn't actually uh, follow through on its promises, Let's see if we can actually develop one that does follow through on it. Okay, now if I can take a minute in defense of active nihilism and the perpetual transvaluation of values. You desiring machine, you. Yes, let me appeal to a different figure. Let's think about Spinoza and Nietzsche and Deleuze. <clears throat> and the idea being, uh, rather than there being an arbitrary decisionism, a la Schmidt, that what you get in Nietzsche via Deleuze, sort of with uh, an appeal maybe to 
Spinoza in this idea of like a monist ontology, a singular plane of immanence that is prior to anything. The, the thinking of radical immanence in the first instance, not as being something that is in relation to transcendence or that is in opposition to transcendence, but that is this, this sort of starting point that we need to, to, to try to think radically in the first instance. What then you get in the idea of the transvaluation of values is the, and I'm drawing on the work of a philosopher by the name of Daniel Barber here, what you get is this idea of the perpetual naming of immanence. So immanence, like Prozorov wants to argue the void has, immanence has an unbounded multiplicity that exists beyond the codes or the identities of any intraworldly epiphenomenal or phenomenological identity. And transvaluation of values isn't an arbitrary activity of of, of nihilism so much as it is the affirmation of unbounded potency that we can just never catch up with, with our linguistic designations or our identifications or our social structures or our practical ensembles or our uh, ethical orderings, right? And so we have to perpetually rename and recode even as those names and those codes are perpetually being scrambled because of flux and flow and process and the unboundedness of imminence. So in that sense, I think that Prozorov is maybe discounting the Deleuzian, as he calls it, Deleuzian, Bergsonian, what we may call Spinozist, Nietzschean, active nihilism, which I'm not even sure I, I'm comfortable with the idea of nihilism being attached to that, but that would be my counter to his argument. Yes, this is that fundamental distinction we have in kind of contemporary continental philosophy, right? Between those who sort of see lack as an intrinsic feature of reality and those who want to do away with the idea of negation entirely and focus only on sort of positive notions, right? Because mm, yeah. Prozorov seems to be kind of aligning himself here with the negation theorists, right? There really yep. is a, a distance between um, the positive conceptions of intra-world politics that are all governed by their own individual transcendental orders, and those transcendental orders don't actually exist anywhere but within those worlds. And sort of, he doesn't use this term, but I guess like the real beneath that, right? The ontological right. order underneath the ontic. Um, and that, is, he's saying, is void. That, that order underneath. Right. And so he wants to find that ontological void in each world and bring it out. And he thinks we can actually get political principles from that process. Whereas the more Deleuzean right. conception like you're um, promoting here might be a little bit more in line with the act of nihilist position, um, although not using the term nihilism, that seems inappropriate to me. Right. Um, to say that there's actually, you could... You could have the world as... Well, it's an act of... Vi it's a vitalism. It's not a nihilism. It's vitalism. Yeah, it, it, nihilism doesn't make sense. It's only nothing if if there's a lack, right? So yeah, it doesn't really make this sense if there's not pure, a lack. This is pure power, <laughs> pure pure vitality, pure life, pure abundance. Yeah, and so I mean, would Prozorov's... Do you think his response to that would be that that's basically going back to passive nihilism? That's just a bunch of antagonisms, like my naming of eminence versus yours? versus theirs and that you still you know you might be comfortable in that sphere but that you're never really achieving world politics at that point there is no world politics at that point yeah so he engages with this in was it the last chapter when he talks about william Connolly in the book the world world of becoming mm -hmm. um and he, and he does a little bit in this chapter as well i don't think i wrote down a quote um but yeah, I think you're right. And I can't, I can't remember the specific argument that he makes. But at the same time, he also, he also gives a sort of nod to Deleuze and Laclau. So here's a quote. He talks about uh, what's called the doctrine of structural causality, which is something that he gets from a philosopher by the name of Bruno Bastilles. Uh, so the doctrine of structural causality 
one is one in which one can observe in various guises in figures such as Althusser and Zizek, Derrida and Nancy, Deleuze and Laclau, and it asserts that the social order is sustained by a structural void that cannot be subsumed under its positivity, which entails both that every positive order is contingent and could be otherwise, and that its claims to completion, closure, and self-imminence are inconsistent. So it, he's, he's interested in this idea uh, of h- how Deleuze also wants to argue that social orders are contingent, but he doesn't like the ontology of Deleuze for probably the reasons that you mentioned. But I can't remember exactly his 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 argument against Deleuze. But it's something along those lines. That, that sounds really important to me, like the distinction. They actually agree, Deleuze and the sort of um, positions that Prozorov is um, promoting here, with the notion that all political and ontic orders are contingent. Right. That's the fundamental right. point of agreement, and it's a huge one. The question then is, is there anything that's absolute given that factor? Right. And Prozorov wants to say, yes, it's the void that's sort of underneath that. Right. Whereas a Deleuzean conception, um, you can tell me if I'm getting this right here, would be basically no, other than, I guess, just no, right? <sighs> yeah, I think so. Because that would imply that there's something other than imminence. Um, I mean, imminence is absolute, but axiomatically in the way that Prozorov wants to proceed? No, because because then that means that there's an absolute necessary relation between the world as void and its sort of puncturing into all of the particular worlds. And I think Deleuze would argue that that relation between, let's call it the virtual and the actual, or between the uh, ontological ground, the, the, the molecular and the molar, he uses all of these different sort of relations, right? That... Um, that, that I think even that relation is contingent. Yeah, and so and, this, and so this it's is, conti- it's contingency all around. Yeah. yeah, and I and I totally vibe with that, and 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 that speaks to me you know, intuitively. But and we're getting really abstract here, so we might want to bring it back in just a second. But it does seem to me like from your Baju to your Mayasu to what Prasha was talking about, the fact that everything is contingent means that there is a necessity there. Right. And so like the fact that everything is non-absolute means there's an absolute yeah. there. And that seems to me to get you somewhere. Whereas, it, whereas maybe for Deleuze, you just stop talking after that. <laughs> well, and, I think this is where you get. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, sort of like, I mean, and some people do argue this. So this is Peter Howard's criticism of Deleuze. He says that Deleuze is sort of like a mystic, an esoteric mystic. And that ultimately he can't make these absolute distinctions. I think at the like the very last line of his book on Deleuze, he says something like, for those of us who actually want to change the world, you know, um, that something along the lines that Deleuze's ontology or philosophy doesn't really provide us recourse to that, you know, because he's kind of, I think the title of the book is actually Out of This World, uh, his book on Deleuze. And he's precisely saying that he's, he, he, he can't give like normative or prescriptive political uh, articulations because he just kind of exists in this realm of perpetual deterritorialization and conceptual abstraction and endless naming of imminence and coding and recoding and stuff like that. Whereas Peter Hallward is like, he's much more of like a voluntarist and wants to try to figure out, okay, no, how can we actually change shit now? And he doesn't think that Deleuze has the tools for that. I don't know if I entirely agree, but I, I definitely see the argument. And I think there's something important to deal with there. Yeah. I mean, there's no true normativity there, which might be fine. I think the argument from the Deleuze side, wouldn't it be like um, developing a theoretical normativity doesn't actually change anything. Usually it just sort of reinforces, you know, and um, currently existing conceptions and orders. And rather than that, just like blow shit up. Right, just conceptually. I mean, more or less. I mean, the thing is, is with every new coding, with every new, let's say, ethical prescription, there is a transformation that's taking place. It's just that we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that that new ethical prescription is the answer. Because it's, as soon as it's been prescribed, it's already been deterritorialized, right? Yeah. So it's the very frustrating, endless process of naming that you run into. Yeah. And, Deleuze. But, and I think that's why it's dis- dis- dissatisfying for people because it's this endless process. Yeah, it's exactly why it's dissatisfying for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, what, what I like about Prozorov, though, is he's kind of 
I think at least implicitly pointing out the huge area of confluence between those two conceptions, right? I mean, mm. I don't think Prozorov would deny at all the majority of those conceptions for Deleuze, right? But just to say, once we do that detitorization, we can then move on from there and do more. We don't have to stop and just wait for the process to sort of repeat again. Well, and I think what Prozorov would say is that the process of deterritorialization itself is secondary to the existence of the world as void that is puncturing into, that is initiating, that is sparking the process of deterritorialization. So deterritorialization is an effect of the relation between the world as void and a particular world in which the world as void, through which the world as void is kind of cutting or bursting or whatever. Yeah, there's a right? ground to contingency. There's a reason why every order is contingent, because the world is void. Right. Exactly. That's it. And so what he then says is he says he's not trying to build a politics to come. And he mentions like not like Derrida or Agamben, but instead he's seeking to provide an ontological account of all politics, including its most familiar forms. So what he means is, is that actually even in what we call politics now, like even in our sort of intra-worldly, intra phenomenological, epiphenomenal experiences, capital P politics, world as void, in here's it's still there. And the reason that we that we can even even give an account, if you will, of our various social systems or ethical systems or legal codes or whatever is precisely because of the relationship between those lowercase w worlds and the capital W world. And that and that's what politics kind of amounts to, is that relationship, that perpetual relationship or warring or battle between the two, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's why he brings up Rancier as a sort of foil to him there, right? Because that's the, that's the conception um, that Rancier doesn't really have. Rancier, he says, is correct in positing that politics is about intra-worldly affairs, right? So it's the world's conception within itself. Um, but Rancière wants to posit the idea of the, the part who have no part, right? Those who are not right. allowed in what he calls the police order of consensus. And that you can sort of create dissensus by focusing on the part who have no parts, showing the, those who are removed um, from the sort of supposedly totalizing system. Right. So think, think of um, like the subaltern or think of, um, <clears throat> I don't know, whatever sort of narrative that might exist. I mean, some people might want to talk about working class struggle, the things that exist on the margins or outside of the consensus order of a given society. And Rancière wants to build out a political program based on dissensus that exists outside of the consensus. Yeah, and it's very much a small p political program, right? Because given right. the way Rancière set it up, you you can't have a, a like a lasting program that comes or that emanates from the part who have no part. It's just a sort of it's sort of a ephemeral, evanescent thing that just exists for a for a moment and then is gone again. Yeah, because then as soon as the as soon as the part that is not what is it the part who has no part? Yeah, yeah the the part of the part of those who have no part as soon as they start to build a program, they then become a new consensus. And so this is where he would probably be critical of like Leclau and Mouffe as well and the idea of populism, right? Uh, of building these counter-hegemonic populist strategies, which is really popular now on the left, especially in the UK surrounding the Corbyn movement, um, Momentum, and, you know, guys that I, I work with, I'm actually, you know, adapting their book into a, a documentary now, Nick Cernick and Alex Williams, but Alex Williams' new book is called Hegemony Now, and it's all about building these counter-hegemonic populist strategies in the vein of Laclau and Mouffe and cultural studies and Stuart Hall and figures like that, uh, that all kind of derives from Gramsci and thought. And so I think that uh, that that kind of would be problematic as well because that hegemony becomes a new consensus for Rancière. Right. And Prosrov's actually, you know, he's using Rancière as a foil here, but he's also saying there's a, there's a broad base of agreement and that he, he likes the idea that there's this intra-worldly notion of politics. Right, and so it's it's the relationship of one part of the world to another, right? The part who have mm. no part with the part who do have a part, right? The consensus part. Mm. He's just saying that's too narrow. 
the only reason that exists right. is because of this more fundamental ontological relation between the capital W world as void and the small w transcendental world. And that's the one we have to focus on in order to actually get principles which we can work with. Mm. Yeah, and I think something that's important to think about too is that he's not speaking in terms of like purity here. Like there's not some pure realm of politics. I think he's completely to sort of mix theorists and and language structures here. The the police state or policing will still it, like it always exists, right? There's no pure realm of politics that he's prescribing ultimately. He's kind of okay with thinking in terms of gradation or variation or sort of degrees of politics as world as void bursting through epiphenomenological social orders, right? And I think he's just ultimately then going to try to argue to maximize, if you will, the ways in which capital P politics is manifest. But I don't think he's trying to say that he's not creating some sort of like utopic vision of, well, what we need to then aim for is some world in which there's a pure political universal order. Because that then would fall into the criticisms that he has leveled in the previous sections in the previous chapters. And that would then just be imperfect nihilism over again. So then here's my question. Um, is he is he not just then setting the bar really low for politics? Like is politics then just this sort of like subtractive project that only exists in reaction to the police order or to the social order or something like that? And if and if it is ultimately this subtractive project, is that a sufficient political project? You think Prozorov is doing that? I wonder. I don't know. That's my concern at this point. I can see why you might think Ron Sayer is doing that, but I feel like he's he's sort of raising the bar from that um, in a sense and saying uh, you know, he hasn't actually gone into the actual which principles emanate from the world as void, which is probably the point where we'd have to see how you go about doing that, right? That would be the actual political project, right? Deriving principles and then taking those principles and working them out into an actual like political program. But it seems like he's making this as universal as possible. He's just making it so it applies to everyone, not just specific groups, not just specific individuals, which seems to me pretty important to make it a world politics, right? I guess he's just trying to make it fit yeah. with the idea of world politics, which means it has to be universal. Yeah, so here's what he says. Here's a quote from him. He says, politics is the practice of bringing the world, capital W, into the world, lower W, lowercase w, by producing its positive intraworldly effects. So the world of the these kind of um, realm of particular worlds and all of its intraworldly positivity are effects of the capital W world as void that cuts through. And so then what I wonder then is does that not then mean that that politics in relation to world as void is is only most post potent when you strip away no i mean i guess that's not true because he's trying to skirt that yeah i guess he's trying to circumvent that that criticism yeah you're right okay yeah it's not a sub, it's not a subtractive politics it it can be it is it's like it's subtractive in the sense that you got to peel away the the plane of transcendental indexing so that you can get back to the world as void but then once you get back to the world as void then it's not just simply subtractive anymore then, it's then there are sort of yeah. like pr then it's productive. Yeah. Okay. And also, I think it's important to say these first two chapters, he's basically developed an elimination argument, right? And saying, here are all the options that seem to be on the table conceptually, and here's why they all go wrong. So the only one left to try is the idea of the world as void. And he's done that several times, right? World is everything? No. World is something? No. World is nothing? Yes. Imperfect nihilism? Mm -hmm. No. Passive? No. Active? No. It's got to be the mm -hmm. one left over, right? Which is... Um, the world itself has nothing. And so he hasn't really done the positive part, right? He's only done the stripping away and the elimination of options to then sort of mm. get us to the point where we're willing to say we've only got one left uh, amongst the alternatives. Mm. I feel like that's kind of the way he structured the argument. So maybe we should come back after the next chapter or maybe at least at the end of the book and say, did he actually avoid this purely subtractive, subtractive process? Okay, so then... Kind of moving into, kind of foreshadowing, let's say, what the next chapter will be. What he says is that there are sort of five ways 
to describe what politics is. So he says, first, and least controversially, politics is a practice. Second, politics is based on the relation between the world, capital W, and worlds. Third, politics is a practice of affirmation. Fourth, politics is a practice of the affirmation of universal principles that in this book he wants to term axioms. And then finally, politics does not merely affirm universal axioms derived from the void of the world, but it affirms them universally for the world in question. And so then he says, this is politics basically defined. He says, politics is a practice of a universal affirmation of axioms arising from the disclosure of the world as void in a given particular world. Yeah, so that whole definition there seems to be just avoiding each of the mistakes that the previous views that he's criticized have made, right? It's like uh, mm. running, through, running through a maze where all these traps are set, and you see the bodies of the previous mm. competitors who went through the maze and trying to figure out what got them, and then you know, dancing so as to avoid the arrows and the spiders and the the ledge that you can't see and whatever else, right? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I'm trying to see here. I'm looking through my notes and see. I, mean, I think that pretty much sums up how it is that he leaves us at the end of the second chapter. Yeah, major major conceptual tease. Yeah, exactly. And, and now he's going to start then developing what these universal axioms are that he derives from the void that can then help us to understand the productive program of politics within its sort of intraworldly effects. Yep. Cool. Um, I'm digging this so far, man. I mean, I, I know I've, I've spent a little time with the guy and I've heard him talk previously, and so uh, I kind of dug it before, but there is something really appealing about this project, even just in its sort of like structural approach. I actually don't find him to be the easiest reader or a writer to read i actually find it pretty difficult at times you yeah it's it's super dense <laughs> fuck man <laughs> i know i'm like we're trying to come up with some some examples and illustrations here to make certain points and they, they always fail to to make it completely but there's not a whole lot of there in the text so you you have to you have to stop and really figure out how you can apply um illustratively some of these things yeah he trimmed the fat man that's why the book is the first book's only like 150 pages and the second one's 120 (laughs) but i i like some like rhetorical flourishes and metaphors and analogies and pictures and things (laughs) you gotta add those in the margins man yeah i guess right well cool well then i guess we'll pick this up uh not next week but the following week so yeah part two chapter three for next time yeah chapter three yeah, so if you've picked up the book and you're reading along with us, great. If not, and you're just kind of enjoying us uh, wrestle through some of these conceptual things, great. Stick with us on this. I know that it is it is very dense, but um, we're going to keep doing our best to uh, to unpack this. And it does get a little bit more program- program- programmatically concrete as it moves on. Not much, but a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Even just a little bit to respite, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, yeah, so we'll pick this up in a couple weeks. Give your brains a chance to digest. All right, so for our next segment, we're doing the sticky leaves. This is where one of us talks about whatever it is that's bringing us meaning in a meaningless world. So Austin, what's doing it for you this week? Troy, you know what we're going to talk about, right? Like, we have to. You're not going to... You can't do that. This isn't... (laughs) I'm not deferring. I'm not deferring. But literally, I was checking my phone every single morning at like 3 or 4 a.m. to see if there was any breaking news on Twitter about LeBron, the Lakers, Kawhi, PG-13. Now they're talking about Damian Lillard. I mean, we got to talk a little bit about basketball. I know that we say we talk about basketball too much on this podcast, but we got to be real, man. This is who we are. We like basketball. We grew up playing basketball. You know, when we get together, you get schooled by me in basketball and so this is like part of how we have intellectually grown together no, as well as our even. athletic endeavors as well if you're gonna bullshit no, dude, whatever bullshit just, well <laughs> okay fine me 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 and you uh when we when we play um with uh, our old friend trey we used to ball people up at the park remember oh so now it's a collaborative thing <laughs> yeah exactly now we're now we're friends i mean i ball harder but you're you're there <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can say that from Australia, man. I want to see you come back and uh, put your money where your mouth is. You got it, brother. 
in 2019. <laughs> <laughs> so all of you who are still listening to us at this point, you are witnesses. There's the LeBron uh, reference again. You're all witnesses that uh, next time Austin's in Southern California, we're going to play one-on-one, and the results will be talked about on this podcast. Probably in okay. Austin's shitty minute as he complains about some various weather how or you environmental cheated. factors which caused him to lose. I don't know what it is. Or how I was he out lost of shape because I've just been – yeah, I, I, I actually I, – I need to get new contacts, so I'm already making excuses. Oh, you're already prepping, yeah. <laughs> Nah, man, I'll beat you with my fucking nearsighted vision. Um, but no, man, I uh, I've been really stoked about. I mean, the only things that I've done lately is I've been reading economic theory and I've been watching videos on mixed martial arts news and I've been watching the World Cup and I've been watching videos and reading shit about the Lakers. So we got to talk a little bit about the Lakers just for a couple minutes. How are you feeling about LeBron James? First of all, without any of the other moves, LeBron James being a part of the Lake Show. Like, there's this competition, right? Is Kobe better than LeBron? Is LeBron better than Michael? And now that can, – can Laker fans embrace LeBron? Are you embracing LeBron? Dude, it's your sticky leaves. Tell me how you feel first. I can respond. Oh, I feel, gr- I feel great. I mean, <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy. I think this is fun. Uh, so many people are saying this over and over again, that the league is better when the Lakers are good. And I think that's something true about that. There's just something glamorous about, you know, uh, Laker basketball. Whether or not you hate them or you like them, it still creates intrigue because it creates emotion. It creates storylines. It creates the drama that makes sports far more interesting than just, you know, people playing with each other. But if there is a little bit of uh, a narrative or a myth that's surrounding it, then it's fucking cool. And, I mean, LeBron's the greatest basketball player on the planet. So having him on the Lakers at least adds that a level of intrigue. And then when you think about the possibility of putting these pieces around him, and even if they don't bring over anybody serious like Kawhi Leonard doesn't come over, um, I still think there's something really exciting about these young core of players around him that uh, that kind of makes the team. Because even though they, they only won, what, like 35 or 36 games last year, they were still fun to watch, even in a losing effort, you know? they Which they hadn't been fun to watch for the previous few years before that. So there was actually something fun last year about them. There was an energy, and uh, this just kind of adds to that. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with everything that you just said. Um, But I'm still going to be very cautiously optimistic about this whole thing. Right. They are not a good team as currently constructed. I should say they're not a great team as currently constructed. They're a good team. Are they a playoff team? Oh, yeah, they're a playoff team. Um, Middle middle of the pack? Barring major injuries. Like. They're like a 40, four, five, four, 45 five? to 50 win team, which okay. last year would have been like the sixth or seventh seed in the West. So okay. um, it kind of depends on what happens to the rest of the, the West, right? And what injuries uh, occur. But the West is tough, man. I think someone said that um, of all the players who have made an all NBA first team in the past 10 years, there's only one player in the East and like 30 players in the West. Yeah. It's, yeah, Gian- it's Giannis, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, the imbalance <laughs> like of power is crazy. The West is just so stacked. And LeBron obviously is amazing, right? But they've also lost several of the best players they had last year. Julius Randle's gone. As of this point, Brooke Lopez is not on the team. Um, they're not going to be that much better if it's just LeBron and a bunch of dudes who are anywhere from average to below average okay so you got you got potentials now of them obviously they're trying to get Kawhi, and so they want to get Kawhi leonard and uh apparently san antonio is asking for the farm right they want like all the young prospects and like fucking two draft two first round draft picks and like money or some shit like that so they want everything which is probably them just being dicks because they're not being serious Um, but if they're going to give Kawhi up, that's what they're asking for. So then you got a lot of people now are saying, okay, so it might not happen. Kawhi's only got one year left on his contract. Maybe he'll go somewhere for a year and then he'll come to the Lakers next year. Maybe he'll just go to the Clippers, but they don't really have enough to kind of deal right now. Maybe with San Antonio, maybe he'll stay in San Antonio. Some people are saying he'll threaten to like sit out, whatever. Um, maybe the Lakers won't worry about him now. So now they're saying, you know, maybe there's Kemba Walker that's out there. 
Maybe they'll deal for Damian Lillard. So what would you like to see? And let me ask you this. If they trade and they give away some central pieces for Kawhi, that's one thing. But what if they have to do that for Lillard? Would you be satisfied? No, I wouldn't be. It wouldn't be the worst option. But here's my basic argument when it comes to LeBron. If LeBron James is on your team, you're a top five offensive team, almost regardless of who else is on your team. That's Mm -hmm. how transcendent he is offensively. As a passer, as a shot maker, he's just, he's the best passer in the league and the most efficient scorer in the league, except for Steph and Durant. And he draws like double and triple coverage, which means shooters are open. Yeah, in the same way Steph and Durant do. So he, his offensive impact is not just about his own scoring. It's about everyone else's scoring. Right. Add in the fact that he's the best right. passer in the league and you have the, yeah, the best offensive player in the league, bar none. Um, he's not a very good defensive player anymore. He just doesn't try that hard very often. He can be when he tries, but he just doesn't because he's old. So you're going to be a top tier offensive team already. If you get Damian Lillard, you're getting a guy who is a great offensive player and who's trash on defense. And so okay. you're, you're getting diminishing returns on offense. You can't get that much better when you already have LeBron, right? So my notion is get a guy. If you're going to get a star, you want to prefer a star who's going to anchor your defense and who can play off LeBron offensively and not have too diminished of a role. Kawhi is perfect. He's a great shooter. A good secondary playmaker. You can stagger your lineup, so either he or LeBron on the floor at all times. And he's the best defensive player in the league. One of the best ever. I mean, yeah. you couldn't come up with a better Pippen-Jordan combo than that. Okay, so so do you give up Lonzo, Kuz, Ingram, Hart, and two round two first-rounders for Kawhi? No, definitely not. Because then you have nothing. Like, you need three other guys on the court. <laughs> do you give up guys. Ingram... Ingram, Hart, and two round, two first round. This is captivating radio, is it not? This is like sports radio right now, but slightly yeah, more listen, intelligent. Listen, if you <laughs> if you just don't give a shit, and that's fine. We still love you. We're not gonna be offended. Like, just turn us off. Just come back next week. <laughs> uh, we're gonna be talking about something else, and then in two weeks, we're gonna pick up the book club again. So, but if you're interested in this, join in. Yeah, m- yeah. My notion is, it's supply and demand, right? You don't have to give up everything the Spurs want, unless someone else is willing to give up that much too. So I don't think anybody is. Otherwise, the deal would have been done by now. So Kawhi said he wants to go to the Lakers. Every other team is worried both about his health and about the fact that he could leave in a year. So I think they should give up um, whatever it takes to get him, barring someone just throwing up their farm at the team. So if it means you right. give up Ingram and a couple of picks because that's the best prospect out there they can get, then I would do that. I wouldn't give up three of their top young guys and several picks just because you're just, there's no need. I can't imagine there's going to be a need to do that. No one else is going to give up anywhere near that much given all the okay. peripherals there. What about picking up Kemba Walker? Is he a restricted free agent right now? No, he's he's uh, got one year left in his contract also, I think. Okay, so how would that work? They'd have to deal for him. Kemba's awesome. I love Kemba. But he's a 30-year-old small point guard. And all the data shows that once small point guards hit their 30s, like it's almost certain they're going to drastically fall off. Okay. And he's only signed for one more year. So that means if you trade for him, you're going to have to re-sign him to a max deal into his mid-30s, which is a disaster waiting to happen. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just don't think... So- uh, Walker or Lillard, as great as they are, and they're great players, they're just not the ideal fits, I think. I'd rather give up those same um, trade ballast for Kawhi. When, why not? Okay, now if that doesn't work, and it's just LeBron with this young core, are you optimistic about the season? And then what other pieces do they need to get just to fill it out? Like, they got rid of Randall, so they need someone big on the inside now, which maybe that was, if they don't get a big trade, then that seems like a bad decision in hindsight, right? But if they do get somebody in the trade, then maybe a good decision. But let's say they don't get anybody in a trade. They don't get Kawhi. They don't get Lillard. They don't get Kemba Walker. They don't get, I mean, they could still sign Clint Capella, right? He's out there. They don't have enough cap room. Okay, so they don't have enough cap room for Capella, so they got to make a trade. That's really the, it's either it's trades and veteran minimums. Is that what their options are now? I think they have like six million left in cap room, so they could get Lopez back. He hasn't been signed yet, and that would honestly be I think the best thing for them right now. I mean, he's not your ideal 
um, fit, but he can shoot and he plays good defense. So um, I, I'd be fine with going into the next year with the young guns um, and LeBron. They'll probably win 45 to 50 games, um, probably go out in the second round, most likely. If LeBron goes completely nuts like he sometimes does, they could make it to the conference finals and lose to Golden State or Houston mm-hmm. or whomever. Uh, and that'd be fine. Like, that'd be cool. But I'm worried about expectations, man. I think Vegas has them as the second most likely team to win the, win the title next year already. And that's just yeah, they're like, tied. <laughs> they're tied for whoa. second right now. I know. That's, no, it's like Golden that's just... State 1, Boston, Celtics, and Lakers, I think, are 2 and 3. Yeah, Houston and Philly have to be above them. Like, it's no <laughs> way, dude. They're not yeah. going to be as good as those teams. As is. It I... does. Yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, maybe they trade for Kawhi, so Vegas is putting that in the odds, but I don't know. Yeah, um, I mean, either way, it, it, it's kind of fun, right? Like, I haven't been excited about Laker basketball like this in a little while. So there is there is something uh, transcendent about LeBron James that I'm sure wherever he went, they'd be they'd be experiencing the same level of of anxiety based on like expectations. And trying to manage expectations and then looking at the pieces. I think like if he would have gone to Philly, I think they would be the favorites to go to the finals in the East for sure. And oh, undoubtedly. I think even a lot of people would be saying they could give Golden State a, a run. It, like he would have fit in fits, perfectly yeah. there. Yeah. Um, but it'll be interesting, man. It's fun. I, I bet you fucking ticket sales are oh, it's cr- insane. Nuts, dude. It's like getting LeBron on your team. Especially when you weren't good beforehand, you know? Like he goes to Boston or something, then obviously they're amazing, right? But coming to a team that was bad last year, that's like you're just some dude, right? Like you work at Best Buy and then like Scarlett Johansson walks into Best Buy and is like, can you fix my computer? And they're like, yeah, I got it. And so you fixed it so well that she asks you out, right? <laughs> and then you're like, well, obviously, yes, this is going to be amazing. But also, I'm going to shit my pants every moment, right? Because who knows what's going right. to happen? And LeBron has a history of being a bit of a prima donna in terms of you know getting coaches fired, getting teammates traded, getting bad teammates signed to massive deals which handicap your team. Like, there's a lot of stuff that comes with LeBron that which is not ideal. Yeah. A uh, one-on-one rumor is that Chris Bosh is talking about coming out of retirement. Oh my God, Chris and Bosh so is going to die on the court, and we're going to have to all see it. I know, I'm but out. you know, advantage. <laughs> I know. I would not like to see that. That would be horrible. For people that don't know, Chris Bosh has like blood clotting in his lungs or some shit like that. I think it's And his so heart. he actually, it's his heart. Yeah. And so he's actually not been cleared to play medically because of this. But he's been out for a couple of years now. And there's some speculation that because of advancements in medical technologies, that they might be able to get him through. Because the NBA has a pretty, I don't know if it's like super strict, but at least there are some minimal requirements that you have to meet in order to. To be uh to pass the the medical clearance, so yeah, I'm so scared. Chris Bosh was one of my favorite players back when he played. He was so good, and he'd be even better today, um, in today's game. With he'd be the yeah, ideal big man. But yeah, it scares the shit out of me, man. To just like I saw a guy die what on the court did? once. Um, you did? Yeah. What's his name? Uh, Lewis, Ricky Lewis. I can't remember his name. Was Ricky Lewis? Something else, Lewis. He was in the Celtics back in the early '90s, and he was supposed to be Larry Bird's heir apparent. Uh, when Bird was kind of having the back problems and was about to retire. And uh, he just collapsed on the court in the game I was watching as a kid. Just collapsed on the court oh, and, and died right in midcourt. It's, it's still a memory that I have to this day watching it. And then there was the player in college at Loyola Marymount. Was it Hank Gathers? You mean Len Bias? Yeah, no, there was a player that died on the court. I don't, I don't uh... remember that. I thought I thought I thought it was Hank Gathers. Uh, anyway, I can't remember, but yeah, no, we don't want to see that. We don't want to see that. But it's exciting, man. Basketball's coming home in England. They say football's coming home when they feel <laughs> excited about their football club. Basketball's coming home, baby. Yeah, maybe we'll, maybe we'll turn Owls at Dawn to a basketball podcast if the Lakers get Kawhi. What do you think about that? <laughs> uh, sure, <laughs> I'm down. We'll, we'll do a separate like ten minute episode every week. Deal. I'm down. <laughs> All right, on that note, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. As I said, uh, two weeks from now, we'll be picking up Chapter 3. Uh, we'll, or maybe maybe 
part two. I don't know. We'll see how, how dense it is. I have a feeling we'll probably just go chapter by chapter from here on out. Um, but next week, uh, Troy, I didn't tell you this, but I'm thinking uh, that we're going to do a cross collab with the boys from Left Out Podcast. It's an economics podcast. So Dante from there, I've been chatting with him. He wants to come on and chat with us about heterodox economics or basically just what the fuck is the economy anyway. And I figure that that might be a really nice chat for us, especially because people get so mystified about economics and they're so confused over, you know, unemployment numbers and debt problems and deficit issues and modern monetary theory and all of these words that get thrown around. And people are like, well, how are you going to pay for these social programs and all of this shit? So we're going to get an economist on here to chat with us and to hopefully delve into some of these problems to demystify things about the economy. So hopefully that'll be next week. Um, until then, where, where can people find us? They can find us at owlsatdawn.com. Uh, you can leave, download episodes from there, leave the comments for the episodes. If you want to ask questions or have comments about uh, this chapter from the Prozrod book, we'll be happy to discuss those. You can go to iTunes and uh, find Owls at Dawn and give us a five-star rating and a review. It can help us get the podcast out to more people. And uh, on Twitter, at uh, owls underscore at underscore dawn. And you can email us, owls at dawnpodcast at gmail.com. You can do that as well. Sweet. Uh, anything else we got to say? Yeah, just the last thing. What's that? Das Padani, Americanski. <laughs> <laughs>